Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to Trigger Precision Machine. Today we're going to start a new multi-video series on long range shooting. Very similar to reloading, this is a pretty technical topic and there's a lot of information to cover. So we're going to break this up into several videos over the next couple weeks and hopefully get a good amount of information out there for you guys. That being said, you could spend your entire life learning about this stuff and you'd still have more to learn. It's just a massive topic and the deeper you get into it, the more technical it gets. Today we're going to talk about the information we need to successfully use a ballistic program. This can lead to a lot of confusion and frustration among new long range shooters because a lot of times the ballistic curve that we get from these programs doesn't necessarily match our actual ballistic curve that we're seeing in the field. So there's some ways to manipulate the program and we'll get into that later. But for now we're going to take a look at one of the programs on the computer. And as far as resources for this go, there's a lot of good free ballistic programs. There's the paid apps for the iPhone and the Android platforms, and then there's also the Kestrels nowadays that have the Applied Ballistics program already installed. So the output that you get from those takes all the environmental factors into account as well. So let's jump back in the office and we'll take a look at one of the programs and see what kind of inputs we need to make a ballistics chart. All right, here we are at the JVM Ballistics homepage. The web address is just jvmballistics.com. Then we want to click on that ballistics tab over there that's circled in red on the left hand side. And once we're on the ballistic calculator page here, we want to click on that trajectory link at the top. There's a lot of good resources on this page, but for now we're just going to stick with the trajectory tab and that takes us to the main ballistic solver. And now we land on the main ballistic calculator page. So if you notice, there's a lot of inputs here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go line by line and just quickly go over what each of those means and if it's necessary or not and what effect it has on your overall ballistic curve that you're going to get from this program. Here at the very top of the page we have the library drop down menu. And what this is is a database of hundreds of hundreds of bullets from all the major manufacturers and that gives you the correct BC, ballistic coefficient, the bullet diameter, the caliber, and then the bullet weight and grains. As you're looking through the database, you might notice that certain bullets are listed multiple times. And this is because there's multiple drag profiles for each of these bullets. And a lot of them are submitted by either the manufacturer or people like Brian Litz, who's the chief ballistician for Burger Bullets. And Brian uses a Doppler radar to track the bullet along its path and develop a very, very accurate ballistic coefficient. So in short, if you see a ballistic curve with Brian Litz's name attached to the back of it, pick that one because generally those are more accurate than the other ones that are just based off the manufacturer's estimated ballistic coefficient. Before we go any further, it's worth talking about what a ballistic coefficient actually is. Ballistic coefficient is a bullet's ability to overcome drag during the course of its flight. And there's a couple ways that they measure this. A Doppler radar tracks the bullet's flight downrange, or two chronographs spaced a known distance apart that gives you a start velocity and the velocity downrange, and you can determine a ballistic coefficient using that as well. The two most popular drag models used to calculate ballistic coefficients are a G1 drag model and a G7 drag model. So the G1 drag model is still really popular, but it's really designed for flat-based, stubby bullets whereas the G7 profile is actually developed for today's modern boat tail bullets. So it is a more accurate choice, and it should give you a more accurate trajectory chart. If your bullet's listed in the library, you want to select it from there, but if your bullet is not listed, then we have these three boxes here to input the bullet data in order to calculate the trajectory. So first off is ballistic coefficient, and there's a little blue hyperlink next to ballistic coefficient there, and that'll take you to a page of different ballistic coefficients for all the major manufacturers that are pre-calculated for you. So it gives you a good starting point. And next to that is your bullet weight, and that's just whatever your bullet weighs. And then there's the caliber, 308, 243, 357, etc. Here's where we input our velocity information. It's very important to make sure you have a good velocity average. So I would highly recommend shooting more than five rounds so you get a statistically significant average. So what that's going to do is by shooting more rounds, it's going to make that extreme high and extreme low less significant in calculating the average. And then we have the distance to the chronograph, and that's pretty self-explanatory. I usually use a magneto speed or a labradar, so I usually put zero in that box. But if you're using a typical light sensor chronograph, then you want to measure the distance between the end of your muzzle and then the beginning of your chronograph. 
Here's where we input our sight information. So for sight height, we're looking for height over bore of our optic. So the center line of your bore to the center line of your optic, and that's the dimension that we input there. As far as sight offset goes, I've never used that. And what that is, is if your sight is offset to the left or the right of the center line of the bore, you're going to enter that information there. So I usually leave that zero. All right, guys, just ran out here to the shop to walk through measuring the height over bore. So what we're looking for again is the center line of the bore to the center line of the scope. So do your best to estimate the center line of your bore. Fortunately for me, this top edge of the manor stock is dead center with my bore. And then this split line in the scope rings is center for the scope. So from there, I just take my calipers and I use those two marks. And we end up with 2.0755 for my height over bore. And that's what we'll input into our ballistic solver. And here we come to two boxes that I never use, zero height and zero offset. I always zero my rifles, point of aim, point of impact, and 100 yards. But some people like to zero their rifles high at 100 yards, so that's where you would put that number there in zero height. And zero offset is just a left or right offset of your zero in relation to your point of aim. So unless you have some special circumstance, I would leave both of these at zero for now. And next up we have elevation and windage. So these are not typically used and what these are is the vertical and horizontal angle that the barrel makes with the line of sight. So we don't need to worry about those for what we are doing here today. Line of sight angle is the angle between the rifle and level ground. So this is used when you're shooting uphill or downhill. So if you're shooting uphill you're going to input a positive number there and if you're shooting downhill you're going to input a negative number there. Your cant angle is the angle of the rifle to the left or the right. So generally we shoot with our rifles leveled so we keep this value zero. And now we get to two more important pieces of information, wind speed and wind angle. For the purpose of developing a dope card or trajectory card, I'll always use five miles an hour. And the reason I do that is it allows me to quickly get wind calls for two and a half mile an hour winds or 10 mile an hour winds just by multiplying and dividing that five mile an hour value. And wind angle is just that, the direction that the wind is coming. So winds that travel straight up range and down range have no effect on our trajectory, but winds from the right and the left do. So I'll input 90 degrees here and that lets me have a full value wind call. And from there, I can divide it in two and have a half value wind call or whatever I need at the time. For target speed, I usually input two and a half miles an hour and that's exactly what it sounds like, the speed that your target is moving laterally at. So the two and a half gives me another good increment that I can multiply times two for a five mile an hour moving target or four for a 10 mile an hour moving target. And that's a pretty easy and quick calculation that you can do in your head on the fly. And target angle just allows you to specify the angle that your target is moving. So for the purpose of the dope card, I always leave it at 90 and that's a target that is moving laterally across your field of view. If you wanted to calculate danger space, you would input a value in target height but danger space isn't regularly used and it's fairly complicated to explain. So if you're interested in it, there's a bunch of good resources on the internet. So you might take a look at those. And now we make it to the range section. A lot of these are pretty self-explanatory and these all control the output of the ballistic program. So minimum range is the minimum range that you're going to get ballistic data for. The maximum range is the max range you're going to get ballistic data for. And then you can determine the range increments for a precision rifle. I usually use 50 yards. And then the zero range is whatever you zeroed your rifle at. So for me, typically 100 yards. And here's where we input our environmental data. And this is why I say I always record the environmental data when I go shoot. So for this section, you have one of two choices. You can either input the data from the day that you shot your zero, or if you're going somewhere that's going to have significantly different weather conditions or environmental conditions, you can estimate those best you can and then put that data there so the output that you get from this ballistic solver is a little bit more accurate. And now here we are at the final section and we have a couple more options for inputs and outputs. The first is vital zone radius, so you can specify a dimension in inches here and this will give you a max point blank range. So what the max point blank range is, is the yardage that you can effectively hit within that radius without an elevation change. So either dialing your turret or holding over. So that's pretty handy to know for hunters since you can specify an estimated vital zone for the animal you're hunting. And we have our energy column there and that just allows us to choose which unit of measurement our energy is displayed in for our ballistic chart.
Then we go down to our last two boxes, column one and column two units, and that allows us to specify two different units of measurement for the output data on our ballistic chart. So we'll have our elevation and windage corrections in both of those units of measurement that we choose there. And that was kind of a crash course on how to use that specific ballistic program, but the other ones out there generally require the same inputs. So hopefully that clarifies any questions you had, if you had any. And tomorrow we're gonna to take this one step further. We're gonna input some data into our ballistic program and see what kind of outputs we get. So stay tuned and thanks again. We'll see you tomorrow.